The question is why do you use these big D's instead of little D's? Why do you really have to do that? What if I use a little D? What would that what would that do? I like to think of this as let's say you got some cars going around on the street. Now I'm going to have them just sliding around. It's like the street is iced over. Cars' wheels don't really matter. They're just kind of like slipping around. It doesn't matter if the car's turned on or not. Okay, within the cars, you've got this really good... It's kind of like a speedometer, but it tells you how fast you're going and which way you're going relative to the, the Earth. Like, maybe it uses GPS or something to figure out your velocity vector relative to the Earth. So it can just tell you what your, what your speed is, or what your velocity is. It tells you what your velocity vector is. Alright. Now, the idea is that there are these forces present. Alright, one of them is this tau thing, tau ij over xj. That's from the um, stress tensor. And then there's this g, this gravity body force. The important thing about those those fields which create forces is that they're really defined with respect to stationary coordinates like like the the road the surface of the earth or whatever i mean you you could maybe define a a force in terms of the coordinate system that follows your car around it's a certain place in your car but it's that's not what it is these are these are things that are just based on the, the location that you are on the street, right? And the cars move around. So, what if you just said, well, I'm going to do this formula, but I'm going to replace the big D's with little d's. Now, would there be a problem? So, you pull out your, your thing that measures velocity, I guess. And since if you're using a little d, little d u or little d t, now the way that you want to do it is walk out into the street, stand in a certain place, maybe make yourself a ghost so you can just stand there and cars just go right through you or something, and then you're going to measure what the velocity is of the cars. And since it's with respect to time, what I'll do is take two measurements. I mean, it's supposed to be instantaneous, but I'll just take two measurements separated by like uh, one second, which I assume is a very small amount of time. All right, uh, it should go down to. Uh, technically, it'll have to go down to zero, but whatever. Uh, yeah, so I'll take two measurements. And I'll say, well, how much did it change with respect to time? How much did the velocity that I measured change with respect to time? So, one thing that, that could happen is that a car could come by a certain velocity, and then some other car could go, happen to come by like way faster. Now, does that have anything to do with these? force fields. Uh, does that tell you anything about the force field? Like, I saw a car going in, in south uh, 50 miles an hour, then I, and then a few minutes, uh, one second later, I measured 100 miles an hour going south. Does that mean that there's some kind of force acting at that point that made that change? Well, not really, because it could have just been that the, the car showed up and it happened to be going faster. From, you know, it was just going faster before and it just happened to show up. Another thing you could have is just a, a car with another car right behind it that's just uh, weighs more. It's got a higher mass. And that would also, since we're talking about momentum, 
um, you would actually measure a change in momentum. Uh, when when the bigger cars showed up, not not necessarily because of any force field, but just because that bigger car had mo more moment. All right, all right. The other way is with the big D over big DT, and that entails being in a car and reading the little velocity gauge that tells you what your velocity is as, as you're going around. Now, when you see that velocity changing, at whatever point, you know, there, you can pick a certain point where you're going to do this analysis or whatever. Uh, you, know, you take two measurements separated by one second. That's actually going to be at two slightly different points since we're since we're talking about separated by a second, but it's going to, in the limit, it's going to go down to one point that you're taking this measurement. Okay, you take these two measurements and you see, well, I was going south like 20 miles an hour. Now I'm going south like 30 miles an hour. Um, the weight of my car didn't change. Something had to make it. Something had to make the momentum change, and that had to be. The, the force fields, either this body force called G or, well, it's, it's rho G, or this, this other force, it's the partial tau over, over partial x, which has, has, has to do with the stress tensor. And then if you consider that, instead of cars, if you just consider a continuous fluid, then... The, the lowercase d or lowercase dt is putting a sensor in the fluid that just measures the velocity. Well, I mean, it has to somehow measure the momentum, really. But, I mean, measuring the velocity would give you the idea at one point. It's always at that one point in the fluid. And the, and the other kind of sensor is like a little floating ball or something that just kind of follows the fluid around wherever it goes. It always tells you what the velocity is. That's the big D over big T. And that's, I mean, the big D U over big DT. And that's what you want to use. Because when that changes, when that big D U over, over big DT, when that changes, you know that at that point in the force fields, you know, there are these force fields present, and you know that they must have caused that, that change. Thank you.